this is a little bit of a different presentation than a, than a normal kind of uh, research talk on what we kind of typically do on the research front, which is a, it happens to be a bit of a data dump usually where we try to spew as much information as humanly possible in, a, in the shortest amount of time. Uh, and now I've got longer time, so if you give a researcher two minutes, I'll take an hour. Um, and I'll try to keep that a little bit shorter. Um, but I'm going to start actually a, a very similar way that we typically uh, usually start. And, and that's often by citing uh, an article like this. And this, this one happens to be from uh, Kim Anderson at the University of Miami. Uh, and she surveyed individuals with spinal cord injury and asked essentially, asked these people what their priority for uh, recovery really is. Uh, and so the researcher, you, you justify your own existence and, and say that, you know, according to individuals with spinal cord injury, fill in the blank, uh, is a priority target for recovery. Uh, and the important part of this, this sentence is essentially this individual with spinal cord injury. And the reason, of course, that's important is that these people are, are the consumers and they should be driving essentially what we're studying. Uh, I just, I wanted to delve a little bit into a recent news and it's hard to avoid this uh, today because this article actually just came out today so it's a little bit perfect timing. Uh, and this is from a group in Louisville uh, and, and they're looking essentially at motor control after spinal cord injury or what is motor control and they're trying to improve outcomes from a motor control perspective using epidural spinal cord stimulation. This made uh, some big, big headlines a few years back and this is the follow-up study. Uh, so now they're up to actually four patients uh, where they've implanted epidural stimulation and now they're actually looking at outcomes uh, with this implanted stimulation. Um, this, kind of, this kind of study involving uh, movement outcomes which gets kind of perceived by the general public as now people are walking after complete spinal cord injury, I think, or this is often the case, gets picked up by the media, uh, some more reputable sources than others. We have, we have Fox News up there and they always have these elegant headlines and are zapping the spinal cord with electricity. I'm, I'm not sure who says okay on this. On this one, but, um, but you can see that this quickly picks up kind of momentum and this I think is it's not necessarily a problem, but it's really where the focus of what a cure really is. And this might appear a little small, hopefully you can see it a little bit. But this is, this is from, the, the, from Kim Anderson's paper. And when I think about what a cure really is, I think it's a much larger concept. We're not talking about uh, one or the other. Uh, we're really talking about function. And function is at the center of all of these problems. Uh, and in talking about function, many of these other outcomes feed into function. Uh, so, of course, you have movement uh, and you have sensation, uh, but these are really just, and how these two affect walking is obviously important, but I think there's a number of others. Uh, but, uh, here you have autonomic function, which is very small, uh, bowel bladder, you have sexual function, uh, and what I'll be talking a little bit about today is uh, pain. So all of this really, to me, represents what the cure uh, essentially is. So getting back to my, my first slide, according to individuals with spinal cord injury, pain is a priority target. Um, and in fact, they do list it as a priority target if you don't believe me. Uh, and this, this is a little bit of research magic here because uh, the number can go as high as 80% of individuals with spinal cord injury report some kind of chronic pain condition. The number can go as low as 10%. So it really depends on, on, on who you trust, but the number is very high. Uh, pain is often reported as very severe. Uh, and it's typically refractory to most treatment. So when we talk about treating pain, we're not so much treating pain as we are managing pain. There is no single treatment for, for pain after spinal cord injury. Uh, th this is uh, getting into some of the terminology and this is one important difference. Uh, when I'm talking about spinal cord injury and, and, uh, sorry, I'll just get higher, um, and pain is that there's an important difference and this needs to be made right away between acute pain and acute pain is protective. Uh, we've all experienced acute pain. Um, in this illustration, uh, studying the toe and experiencing pain is, is a form of acute pain. And according to the illustrator, um, in your own personal beliefs, this is a blessing from God. Um, the, the problem is, in, in terms of, of chronic pain, is when the acute event really persists for a long period of time. So now you have an acute event, in the case of spinal cord injury, you might have some pain associated with a traumatic spinal cord injury, and then the pain sticks around well after it should. 
this is essentially uh, chronic pain. I think in the in the discussion of uh, of pain, it's hard to avoid uh, some philosophical discussion. I mean, after all, many of us in the room are either aspiring to have uh, a PhD, which is a doctor of philosophy, or, or have one. Um, but it, it's kind of a hard topic to avoid, uh, and actually, it's a fun one, and it has a lot of points that we could debate. Uh, one of the the texts that is very interesting, and I'm kind of fooling you a bit here because I've made it through the introduction of this particular text, but uh, there's, there's ten other parts that you can get to, but uh, is this uh, very, very deep uh, text called The Body in Pain uh, by Elaine Scarry. One of the central components to this, um, she, she makes this claim, and, and to have uh, great pain is to have certainty, and this is kind of a line that stuck with me. Uh, and to hear that another pa person has pain is to have doubt. Um, and I think we, all of us in the room, might might be able to appreciate both ends of this. We've certainly been in pain, and, and certainly I can say from my own experience, we've also doubted how much pain someone else is in. Essentially, this kind of loops around and around and around and doesn't stop, and and you have an increase in the amount of suffering that one has uh, in response to their their, their pain. The other central component, uh, her kind of uh, thesis, uh, is really about the inexpressibility of physical pain. Uh, I don't think you have to go a whole lot further um, in the context of medicine. This is the typical scale that we ask people to rate their pain. Uh, there's no real vocabulary associated with it. Um, in fact, this would actually be probably a more advanced scale. Uh, a nice example and a homegrown example is, is the McGill Pain Questionnaire. Uh, and this is uh, from a leading uh, pain physiologist, uh, Ronald Melzack. They listen to a number of, uh, of patients describe their pain, hundreds of patients, uh, and, and essentially came up with uh, uh, terms that they use, the vocabulary they use to describe their pain, and came up with this questionnaire. One example or, or category uh, of descriptors, hot, burning, scalding, I think these are these are pains that we can uh, perhaps imagine. A little bit of a, a little bit of a side note, but, um, and I just think this is interesting, and it's not a coincidence. Uh, Ronald Melzack and with his colleague uh, Patrick Wall, I think typically people think of the um, psychosocial element of pain, the description of pain, how how people characterize pain in a, an emotional context, and the physiology as being rather separate events. And I don't think that's true, and I think. The fact that the same guys were prominently involved in the development of both an understanding of the physiology and understanding of the descriptors involved in pain really reflects what you need to, to, to know to, to appreciate both. And if, if you're familiar with this and if you've taken a, uh, perhaps a first year physiology course or uh, you're doing your PhD at the 22nd year of physiology course or whatever it is by the time you get to the PhD. Um, you're probably familiar with the gate control theory of pain. And this is one that's, I mean, this is still cited in, in, in texts and, and papers today. It's really the leading way we understand the physiological aspects of pain is from 1965. So we go from an understanding a, a, of pain in terms of numbers and grimaces and how the face looks when someone's in pain uh, to a better description of pain to a physiological kind of theoretical understanding uh, we're now at a point where we're trying to objectify pain. We're trying to understand and quantify the painful response. Uh, and when I talk about objectifying pain, what I'm really saying is uh, how pain looks when you look at the anatomy and the physiology. A large part of that in, in the human uh, condition and our understanding of, of uh, human pain uh, really comes from advanced neuroimaging techniques. So, functional magnetic resonance imaging. This really has allowed kind of a, a tremendous amount of insight into what the brain is doing. It does get a lot of popular press. It does not read minds, even though occasionally uh, stories get picked up like that. Uh, but what, and I've been very fortunate to be a part of uh, a number of studies that have, have used this technique. But essentially what I wanted to show here, uh, and this is actually work from uh, Jane Offley at uh, University of Zurich and, and ETH. Um, she did all the hard work um, and she's now at the uh, University of uh, California, San Francisco. Uh, 
Uh, but essentially all she did was she stimulated with painful stimulation in the, in the periphery, so uh, on the hands, so she just kind of zaps people with a, a very pinprick-like uh, heat stimulation. Uh, these top two rows are, are stimulation in the hand, uh, and this bottom row is stimulation in the abdomen. Uh, the point really is, is that the brain responds very similarly, no matter where the, where the stimulation happens. Uh, you get a very kind of characteristic response to this uh, noxious stimulation. Uh, I'm not sure that we can see it, I don't know how big the screens are, but uh, areas of the brain such as the anterior cingulate cortex right here, you get secondary somatosensory cortex here and here. The point is, is that you get these really characteristic activations. Uh, and, and this, is, this can be described any number of ways using any number of different things of stimulation. Recently, this actually gained uh, quite a bit of press last year. Um, and again, for those researchers in the room, perhaps one of the primary reasons it gained a lot of press is because it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is uh, among the most prestigious uh, we, we publish everything in. Um, but they also did some very nice work, and they also, I think, have a very sexy science title uh, talking about the neurological signature of physical pain. Um, and Armin Kurt loves sexy titles, uh, so we're always trying to make something similar, but it's very hard to do, believe it or not. Uh, but if, if you look at the, uh, the pain, the, the, uh, using the, this functional magnetic resonance imaging, you can actually predict how much pain someone's in. So this, this was big, this was a, this was a very big paper, uh, a lot of controversy um, surrounding some of the techniques they used. They actually, if I have a little time, I can go a little bit more into it. One part of the uh, experiment actually differentiated social pain from physical pain. Um, and the way they did that is they showed pictures um, of ex-partners to people while in the fMRI. And I think that's, a, I wouldn't have ever thought to do that, but essentially what you're doing is you're creating social pain. Uh, very interesting idea. And they were able basically to dissociate the physical pain from the heat stimulation from the, from the social pain that someone perceived uh, from seeing someone who tragically broke up with them. Um, sorry, this, this, actually, this article actually predates uh, that New England Journal of Medicine paper um, and raises some very interesting ethical issues attached to this neuroimaging. Ones that I had actually never thought of until I met Karen Davis at a, at a conference. Um, and if you review this paper, she nicely goes over the advantages and disadvantages of, the, uh, of this technique, of the idea of using something like neuroimaging to objectify pain. I think one pro that would be of, of great interest and in where I see the use of, of these types of techniques is personalized medicine. This is kind of a hot topic. Everyone loves the concept of personalized medicine. The idea being someone, you know, the, the same two people with neuropathic pain, perhaps their brain looks different, and you respond to that uh, accordingly. So one treatment might work for someone, one treatment might work for another person. But you're essentially personalizing it based on these, these surrogate mar uh, measures of pain. The danger, though, and for me this is a, a very significant danger, is that you're substituting the self-report. And why is that dangerous? Well, think about who would ultimately end up paying for the treatment. So if you're saying, no, I don't care what, you know, you, you say it's a 10, your brain tells me it's a 2, and if it's a 2, I don't pay for your treatment. So that's the, that's the risk you run when you're moving in the, towards kind of a complete objectification of pain. In some uh, environments, in, in the American environment, the American healthcare system, obviously this is a little bit more of a concern when you're talking about insurers paying for uh, certain types of treatment. So there's certainly a, a number of different ethical issues attached to the idea. When we talk about spinal cord injury pain uh, specifically, I think it's important that we distinguish what types of pain we're talking about. Uh, on one hand, we have nociceptive pain. Nociceptive pain is the shoulder pain that is often reported after a spinal cord injury. Uh, this, is, this results from overuse, for example, from wheeling or from transferring a uh, car to chair or chair to bed. Uh, but the neuropathic pain is something that uh, really is, is perhaps a bigger unknown. There's really not a lot understood about why people have neuropathic pain. And when I'm talking about neuropathic pain, this is the type of pain that's resulting directly from the spinal cord injury. So that's the, the there's damage in the spinal cord, and it can also be peripheral, uh, uh, the peripheral nervous system as well, but 
uh, in cases of spinal cord injury, of course, you have uh, the majority of the damage occurring within the cord. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's two types of neuropathic pain. Uh, there's um, a spontaneous uh, pain, often described as like a burning pain. It's almost always there. It's, it, it's present. It might fluctuate up and down. Uh, but for the most part, it's always reported as being there. Uh, and then there's the evoked pain. So you have this, this distinction between spontaneous and evoked. Evoked, I always think of as a particularly cruel type of pain because it's, it, it, for some reason that we really don't understand, even light touch transfers into pain. So it's called allodynia. Uh, or the technical term is allodynia. Uh, and I've, I've always thought this is very cruel because you can have, you know, a loving embrace or something along these lines where you touch someone's face or you try to help a person. And it's an excruciating amount of pain that the person uh, perceives in response to that. And I think that's a, it's a very difficult one to understand, especially a, a, in a healthy condition where you would have no idea what, type of, what that pain feels like. After spinal cord injury, this, the situation becomes obviously very complex. I mean, this isn't neuropathic pain like Neuropathic pain is associated with other conditions, like failed back uh, is obviously a, a big concern associated with a lot of neuropathic pain. Uh, after spinal cord injury, you have this huge area where you have impaired or, in some cases, completely absent sensation. And that's the other element that I've always perceived as, as neuropathic pain after spinal cord injury being very uh, cruel, in that you have a, a section where a person reports no functional sensation whatsoever. Touch them, you can move their leg, they have no idea where their leg is, but they still report burning sensation. Uh, so there's, I mean, it's a completely useless type of sensation that someone's perceiving, uh, and obviously very cool. Uh, if you look at the level, sometimes within a band close to where their injury is, um, in this particular example, it's a, it's a T10 uh, type injury. Um, at the level, they're often very sensitive. This is uh, evoked an area of very high incidence of uh, evoked pain. And then often many segments below you have uh, what is called below level neuropathic pain. So they distinguish between the, these types of pain right away. As far as um, assessing uh, these types of pain, you really have uh, two options. Uh, the first option is to test within these sites so you can look within the area that the person is, is reporting. Uh, pain and test there and, and see how their sensation differs. The difficulty with this is that no two spinal cord injuries are alike. So you have a guy who virtually has no sensation and a guy who has virtually intact sensation. Both are reporting neuropathic pain, so it's very difficult to distinguish between these two. The alternative is to test above. And if you go above, the advantage is that you have completely intact sensation. So you can test the hand in a guy with paraplegia. There's nothing disrupting his hand from, from his brain where he perceives sensory stimuli. So you, you can bet that he has relatively normal sensation. But what you're looking for there is actually very subtle changes that are, that are difficult to detect using your kind of standard clinical technique. Which is a reason you have to get into, kind of delve more into the anatomy, more, in, more using these advanced techniques. Uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging is something I've brought up. Anatomical, uh, advanced anatomical resonance, uh, magnetic resonance imaging is another uh, popular way of looking at anatomy. Um, and again, I have to, I just have to acknowledge one person in particular. This is uh, Catherine Newitzer. I think this is when she was at Whistler or something like that. When she sent me that picture. But, um, she's done most of the work here and I just get to present it, so I'm very lucky. But if you look at uh, changes in anatomy that occur above the level of the injury, um, and this is uh, an image of a person with uh, a spinal cord injury. This is an MRI here. Uh, this gray part is the spinal cord. Where it, let's go back, this white um, is where you have uh, changes due to, the, in this case, a traumatic spinal cord injury. So you can see a couple interesting points to note. It spans several, or three in this case, uh, vertebral segments from C4 all the way to C6. This is not uncommon. Um, and, and it's kind of denoted by this, this signal change um, in this gray area. So this is where the spinal cord injury is. This is your standard MRI approach. If you use slightly more sophisticated um, imaging techniques and go above the level of the injury. Um, so you now, in, in this case, you're actually looking at the, at the second uh, vertebral segment, the, the C2 segment, and just look at the cross-sectional cord area of the spinal cord. So the, uh, 
that, that typically, I'm holding my pinky because that's the normal size of a, of a, of a spinal cord in most of us, um, adjusted for kind of uh, size in, in healthy controls. After spinal cord injury, you actually have quite robust changes in the cross-sectional cord area. So you have, you have shrinkage in the cord. Uh, and this actually occurs over a period of time from acute to chronic. Uh, Patrick Rohns here, he, he recently published a paper in Lancet Neurology showing how these changes occur uh, over a long period of time. But these are general changes. This happens across most individuals with spinal cord injury. You have, you have shrinking of the cord. In total, it's about a 20% reduction um, in the cord area. So it's not, it's not a, a marginal change. It's a rather significant change. In relationship to neuropathic pain and talking about below level neuropathic pain, uh, again, if you look at the, the control subjects here uh, and the range of the, the control values, uh, what I think is interesting is, is this difference here. The, and these, this star, of course, again, for the researchers here, this is the, of the utmost importance. Uh, so there's significant difference between these two groups. Um, the, those with below-level neuropathic pain tend to show more severe damage in the spinal cord. So this right away potentially gives a mechanism as to why some people develop neuropathic pain. Um, and, and, that and, and that reason being that they actually have uh, a rather more severe injury. Uh, so the severe damage accounts for why someone develops it. But what happens elsewhere? I mean, the, the, there's changes in the spinal cord. There's also changes in the brain. I mean, the brain is a, an amazingly plastic organ. The thing changes. I mean, you, if you put an arm in a cast for a long enough period of time, the brain will change. Uh, and, and this has been described in a number of different models, and, and actually in amputations. And poor monkeys have taken a lot of, uh, a lot of the brunt of this research. If you deaffirmate these monkeys, their brain completely reorganizes. The same is true of spinal cord injury. So here's controls. The control area becomes active right where you would almost expect it. This is the sensory homunculus. Um, brushing off your physiology days again, but this is the where the areas of the brain. Um, you can see my all re good researchers use Wikipedia. Um, and you, you can see that the this is where the Different parts of the, the body are essentially located on the cortex, and this is in the primary somatosensory cortex. Uh, and, and this is in, in healthy condition. If you look at dermatomes, and dermatomes are the area of the skin uh, that innervate a particular uh, spinal segment. Um, if you look at uh, these dermatomes that are below the level of the injury, uh, they don't change actually that much. They, they, they shift a little bit, but they stay largely where they're supposed to. But what's really interesting and different is that these dermatomes above the level of the injury. So if you take a paraplegic and you look at his hand, his hand rep representation is completely off. And so is his face representation for that matter. It's really shifted. Um, and it's shifted away from where it's supposed to be. That's true if, if you apply heat sensitive or a heat stimulus. And it's also true if you apply uh, just a standard brushing stimulus. So in both cases, you have this kind of dramatic cortical reorganization. And this it's been described in, in, in monkeys of up to, up to 1.4 centimeters, which uh, admittedly does not sound huge, but uh, when we're talking about the cortex, that's a, a rather drastic change. Looking at its relationship, again, to, to neuropathic pain, uh, this, I think, or we believe, um, the, the group in, in Zurich, is that this neuropathic pain is, is driving, or, and this gets into a bit of a cause and effect, um, that this neuropathic pain is either causing the change or the change is causing the neuropathic pain. But if you look into, the, into a different area, so this area right here is the, is the secondary somatosensory cortex. And this is, this is, these are the pretty pictures that uh, everyone likes about fMRI. You have a nice brain here and, and you have uh, a lighting up of the brain. It's not quite that simple. There's a few steps that are being omitted here. Um, but it does generate very nice pictures. Uh, and if you look to the, the organization in, in a different area, this secondary somatosensory cortex, those with neuropathic pain, the orange guys here, they show a dramatically more uh, reorganization than those without neuropathic pain. So something, something about their brain is actually processing uh, sensory stimuli differently, but it's doing so above the level of the injury. So it's a, it's a rather global change. Okay, that's it from my uh, uh, in-depth kind of overview of, of what I do and neuropathic pain, a little bit of a discussion on neuropathic pain. 
I just want to, this was supposed to be a very nice segue into uh, Victoria Clayton's uh, talk. It's, un it's unfortunate she couldn't be here. But um, these are just a number of different secondary complications that one has come to expect uh, described as the lesser known consequences of, of spinal cord injury. So you have pressure sores and urinary tract infections and respiratory tract infections. Uh, these, are, uh, these are all very common to spinal cord injury. And then you have another group of orthostatic hypertension and autonomic dysreflexia and cardiovascular disease. Um, the two orthostatic hypertension and autonomic dysreflexia being uh, blood pressure changes and uh, cardiovascular disease being the, the, the obvious thing. Uh, and then you have neuropathic pain and depression kind of uh, finishing out the mix of secondary complications. On some level, I think there's obvious relationships between all of these secondary complications. We, we, we sometimes consider them rather uh, distinctly. We look at pressure sores. We study pressure sores. We look at urinary tract infections. We study those. Uh, but I think there's obviously common links. And within, within the blue guys here, this is linked by the immune system. Uh, within the, the red guys here, this is linked by the cardiovascular system. So it's, it's really not too much of a jump to think that there's probably some relationship between these two. And one thing I didn't mention today is that, that often associated with neuropathic pain, um, uh, you see quite a bit of depression. And I, I've actually, sometimes I think you, 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 can't, you can't have neuropathic pain, particularly chronic neuropathic pain, uh, without having some kind of link with some kind of psychiatric condition because it really can be that bad. But these are, these are generally looked at as completely uh, separate conditions. And, and what I'm advocating for now and part of my research is actually to stop thinking about them as, as um, solitary units. Um, and that really someone after spinal cord injury might develop what is a secondary complication syndrome. And just as an example, and this is uh, some work uh, I'm doing with, with, with Jamie uh, Borisov and with uh, Jack McCrick. Um, looking at cardiovascular disease and looking at the relationship between cardiovascular disease and pain. Um, oh, and I, I should mention as well, this is, this is data from uh, Luke Moreau, which is a big collection of data, and uh, uh, from the Rick Hansen people here uh, as well. So if you look at traditional risk, risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease, I think there's many, many people that are familiar with, many that your doctor probably asked you about. Um, and when you have a spinal cord injury, there's a whole new collection of, of SCI-related risk factors uh, to something like cardiovascular disease. This could be related to the severity of injury, how you were injured, uh, whether you're a paraplegic or tetraplegic. Um, but I think there's also a whole new realm that's yet to really be looked at, and that's the idea that some of these common secondary complications might be associated with each other. So something like pain and depression. If you look in the again in the healthy the healthy group, there is a link between pain and depression and cardiovascular disease. So it's actually not all that surprising that uh, individuals with uh, spinal cord injury, uh, there's a two-fold increase of those with uh, neuropathic pain having cardiovascular disease. I was warned by Jacqueline not to say that the neuropathic pain causes cardiovascular disease. It is tempting when, you, when neuropathic pain is, is what you study, but uh, that kind of remains to be uh, determined in which uh, way this interaction is. So, that's about it for me. I didn't want to go into much more, uh, but I'm happy to take questions. And I thank you very much for, for listening. I hope it was somewhat comprehensible. <laughs>